Hi, it's Bill Mobley and it's On Our Mind. We're talking today with Steve Hickman, who's Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Family and Preventative Medicine at UCSD and who's Director of the Center for Mindfulness. I got to know Steve through our new Center for Empathy and Compassion, a center that we hope will help us understand the brain basis of empathy and compassion, learn how to modulate compassion, and in fact, to enhance people's ability to engage in empathy and compassion. It turns out that some of the tools that we might use uh, are broadly described under the topic mindfulness. And Steve is an expert on mindfulness, and so I'm glad, Steve, that you're with us. Please tell us what mindfulness is and tell us how we achieve mindfulness. Well, I like to think about mindfulness or talk about it as moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness. Mm -hmm. So just to break that down just a little bit, moment-to-moment because it's not just a cliche, but we only have moments to live. Each moment that we're in is the only place in which we can actually accomplish anything, uh, plan anything, even remember anything. But we quite often spend a lot of our moments mentally elsewhere, thinking about the future, worrying about the future, ruminating over the past. And when we can be more present, we actually find that we can be much more effective because we can bring all of our resources to bear on each moment as it arises. So moment to moment, non-judgmental, we often find that we spend a lot of time, we have these amazing brains, these amazing frontal lobes that can plan and judge and, and imagine scenarios and, and plan ahead. But a lot of times that gets us into trouble because then it doesn't allow us to be fully present. And so, sometimes we can let go of judgment when it's not particularly serving us. I can think of a lot of examples, but the one I most like to use is how we think about gravity, which is that we don't really think about it very much. We don't really have any judgments about it, even though gravity exerts certain negative effects in our lives. So I like to say that, you know, even though gravity causes problems when uh, we knock over the glass and it falls to the floor or we look in the mirror and we find that something there isn't quite where it used to be, we don't still, we don't find ourselves waking up in the morning saying, damn, I'm still stuck to the earth. Because we just let that go. We just know that this is the way gravity works in our lives. We let go of judgment about gravity because it doesn't serve us, and we move on with our lives. So that's the non-judgmental piece. And this all rests upon the foundation of awareness, that we can't be aware that we're in the moment or not, or aware of judgment unless we're aware. And so the foundation upon, this, upon which all of this rests is the cultivation of awareness and the way that we most systematically can cultivate this present moment focus is through the practice of mindfulness or through the practice of meditation is the most common means. So most often mindfulness is associated with mindfulness meditation, which is really just the systematic sitting down and bringing the attention, training the attention to be fully present in the moment, moment by moment, even though we know that the mind's tendency is to wander and to get stuck in the future and the past. We're training the mind to stay more present and focused. So when we think of the brain and how the brain operates, is attention a large piece of what mindfulness builds upon? I say that that is the, the foundation, mm -hmm. that it's, in, in our experience of many things, that in anything, it's, there are a lot of different components. Attention is one of them. Sometimes thinking is another component. Uh, emotions are another component. And so like in the example of pain, for example, we have the sensation, the awareness of the presence of pain. And then we have thoughts about the pain. Where did it come from? Why did I have this happen to me? Where is it going to go? And then I, you have all of the emotions, the fear, the anxiety, the uh, any of the kinds of emotions one could have. And so when we're talking about in very practical ways about dealing with pain, we're talking about dropping back down into just the awareness and letting go of the emotional and the cognitive, to just see it as it is. So it's attention, but it's focused attention. It's attention that would allow one to see the thing for what it really is in the moment without having really worried about how it got to be that way or where it might go 10 minutes from now. Yeah, and it's, it's partially about recognizing that, of course, those thoughts and ideas would come up. It's just that we don't get caught up in them so much that we notice, oh yes, I'm having a judgment about this 
sensation of pain or whatever it might be, but not sort of carrying that, letting that wave sort of carry us out to sea, but to just notice that that comes up and to come back to the present moment so that we're aware of everything. We're not checking out. We're not just ignoring things or denying things that are present. We're just working with them in a different way. And mindfulness is really about cultivating that different relationship with our experience. Great, interesting. How do you build mindfulness? What are the kinds of things that people do to enhance mindfulness? Well, the most common one, as I mentioned, is the practice, the formal practice of meditation. Most often people will have a, a kind of a preconceived notion that meditation is some sort of a religious practice or a spiritual practice, and it certainly can be a part of a spiritual practice, but really we're talking about attentional exercise, just systematically choosing to sit down, to notice the, the, the breath as a kind of focus, and to use that as a discipline to bring our attention back moment by moment. It's not an easy thing because the mind likes to wander. It's somewhat its nature to try to wander. And so there's a bit of a challenge because we're not sort of forcing it into submission. We're kind of guiding it back into the present moment. So this takes training, Steve. It does, and it's, it's not easy, but it's simple. Mm. So there is an ongoing practice. There is a, a, a real need to systematically practice this for stretches of time. In the classes that we teach, mindfulness-based stress reduction is the most widely taught program of mindfulness out there. We ask people to practice a half hour, 45 minutes every day, and that's not easy. But it's through that we also know that there's a, there's a dose response. The more that people practice in our courses, the more benefits they derive from having practiced. And we, let's think a little bit about what that tells us about the way the brain operates. The fact that there's a dose response means presumably that there are neural pathways that are strengthened, enhanced, made more workable, more facile by training. Right, and we're just beginning to sort of touch the, uh, the first data around that, and I'm certainly not a neuroscientist myself, but I do understand that there are some measurable changes that happen in the brain, areas of the brain that become a little bit, that kind of retain their thickness mm -hmm. as a result of long-term practice and other kinds of pathways that, that change, sometimes demonstrable even after just participating in an eight-week MBSR course that actual shifts in areas of function change as a result of just essentially doing nothing for long stretches of time. Steve, what, what do people report as a result of having done such training? How does their life change? You know, the best example of that is a gentleman that I worked with for, for several years who had a great deal of chronic pain. He said, you know, I'm a tough guy. He said, I grew up in Detroit. He says, I wrestled in school and I learned to fight my way to the top of my weight class. And I went and played football and had a coach that taught me I had to play hurt and it didn't matter if I was bleeding or crying or whatever, I'd just go in and fight my way through it. And, and he said, and then I got into my career and I fought my way to the top of my field and then I was injured. And for 15 years I've been fighting with my pain. And he said, what I learned through the practice of mindfulness was that it was possible for me to dance with my pain. And it's that kind of a qualitative shift that happens for people. It's obviously different for everybody, but the ability to kind of alter your relationship with things that may not change, or at least aren't likely to change in the moment, to a more comfortable, easeful relationship. And so in various ways, that's often the kind of report I get, not always quite so eloquently, but you can viscerally feel what that means to shift, you're still engaged, He's still there, the pain's still there, but his relationship with it is such that he can move a little more harmoniously through his life as a result of it. So dancing with the pain, is, it is really eloquent. The idea then apparently is, uh, I have this issue I'm dealing with. It's an issue that troubles me. It's an issue that I'm uh, living with for some time. And yet I can change my relationship with that reality by training my brain to be mindful. Absolutely. Whatever that is that's bothering you, that's, that's looming in your awareness, is perfectly worthy of your attention. It's something important. And in the moment, it may or may not be something that's movable or changeable. It may be, and we would only know that if we could pay close attention to the unfolding of it moment by moment. And then sometimes it's not amenable to being moved, and what's, what's more likely the, the better choice is to 
for us to move, for us to shift our relationship, to say, right now in this moment, can I allow it to be here because it is here, and know that in another moment, something else may be called for. I'm, I'm going to get back to the topic of empathy. How do you think that mindfulness training might impact our ability to really feel another person's pain, which is, mm. in a way, one of the definitions of empathy? A big part of what we teach when we're teaching people mindfulness, and it's often framed in a stress reduction kind of model, is we're teaching, we're helping people to come back to a place of being able to respond rather than to react to difficulties, to habitual kinds of things that come up. And so what happens when we come out of autopilot, when we actually return to a sort of an intentional mode of mind, where we're purposely attending moment by moment, we really reconnect to the qualities that we all share as human beings. And among them is that sense of connection, of empathy, of connection to other people, of compassion. And I see it time and again that people, even though they're coming there for stress reduction and they're feeling as if they're getting more control in their lives or they're letting go of needing to control their lives, what comes out of that is very clearly a kind of warmth and kindness to, to themselves and then to other people. And self-report measures in particular of compassion and self-compassion change when people participate in these programs. They access their own self-compassion. They're not learning the skills of compassion. They're accessing qualities that they already possess. At least that's, that's my view of it. Very interesting. Do you, do you think there are new technologies coming online that will help us understand the brain basis of mindfulness and what mindfulness does for us and perhaps even new tools to help us enhance our ability to, to be empathetic, to be more mindful? There are actually, I mean, some of the tools I'm not as familiar with, but I have a, have a colleague, uh, Judd Brewer at Yale, who actually is very interested in giving people immediate feedback about what their brain is doing while they're practicing and actually sort of helping them see the reactive versus the responsive state of mind or the, what some people refer to as the default mode and the intentional mode of mind that actually as a person is practicing meditation they're actually able to be given feedback as to whether they are in that default mode or in that intentional mode to be able to refine the skills. It's a little uh, cutting edge and traditional meditators are a little baffled by the whole concept of meditating a, you know, in an EEG or a scanner of some sort, but uh, it's an interesting approach to being able to sort of hone those qualities. Well, those are qualities we care a lot about. Mm. And so, Steve, we've really enjoyed having you on on our mind, and uh, what you're doing is definitely on our mind as we try to move forward and understand the brain basis of these very important intellectual functions, one of which is, is empathy. So thanks again, Steve. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks for being here on our mind. <laughs>